You're listening to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna Da Silva, and this is Season 3, Episode 3. Today, before we get into our episode, I want to give just a quick announcement. So about a year ago, I created a merch shop for the podcast and uh, created some t-shirts and some mugs. And um, I had the intention of building up the shop more, adding a lot more designs and products, but I have not had the time. I haven't added a single thing since then. Um, And I haven't really been able to keep up with it and um, just keep it up. And it does cost a little bit of money for me to keep this store running. So I have decided that I am going to actually close it out in a couple of weeks. So on June 30th, the store is going to go away, at least for now. Um, there is a chance that I may end up switching it over to a different service that doesn't charge me, but I am pretty busy, so I can't guarantee that. So if you do want to get any of the Females in Fantasy merch, such as a, a t-shirt that has the logo on it, or um, there's also a t-shirt that says, ask me about my feminist science fiction agenda, or um, a mug that says, I like to write about kick-ass female characters. If you want to get any of those things or any of the other things that I have in the store, I'd recommend that you get them now, um, because on June 30th in two weeks, when I close up the shop, I can't promise that, <laughs> that I'll ever put those uh, products up again. Maybe I will, but... Um, pretty good chance that I won't. So if you want to get those products, go on over to shop.femalesinfantasy.com. Again, that's shop.femalesinfantasy.com. And uh, yeah, you can go pick up your merch while it is still available. Today, I am excited to share with you my conversation with Kate Elliott. Sometimes when women are given complex, powerful roles in historically inspired stories, It gets the accusation of being wish fulfillment or political correctness. And so Kate and I wanted to kind of talk about that. We talk about some of the common misunderstandings people have about the roles real women played in history and how this impacts the way fantasy gets written. So we want to, if we're writing something that's historically inspired, we often want to get it right. But (laughs) again, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what that actually means. So she and I go into that. And uh, yeah, I hope you really enjoy. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Kate. Welcome, Kate, to the Females in Fantasy show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm here in cloudy Hawaii. I just want you all to know there are clouds in Hawaii sometimes, but it is still beautiful weather. And I feel guilty because I always have to mention that I live in Hawaii, so people will feel envious of me. So I apologize. Not really. Do you? I was about to say, you don't really sound that guilty. Like I'm hearing the words guilt, but it, I don't hear it in your tone of voice. I think, you know, I've lived here since 2002. I think I just wake up every day and I'm still amazed that I get to live here mm. because it's a lovely place. So my, uh, my mom has friends in Hawaii and they, they often describe similar things where they're just like always in awe of the beauty there. You know, I, I want to say as someone whose career is often built around world building, One of the things I've always noticed about Hawaii is every place has a special aspect to it or some something about it that makes it unique. And one of the things that I noticed when I first came to Hawaii is that it does have this very, I I hesitate to use this word, but I'm going to anyway, this spiritual sense, this sense of a, Mm. a, 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 the, the, in the Hawaiian and the Polynesian languages, they have this term called the mana, which uh, they also was used in role playing games too, I think. But it, it's this sense of power, but not power mm-hmm. like you're going to hit someone with it, but a sense of spiritual and um, some kind of extra beyond physical power. And I, th- I do feel that here. Now, how much I'm projecting because I like it and how much because there is just something <laughs> special about it, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm sure I'm sure it's inspiring. <laughs> it's an inspiring place to, to write fantasy and things like that. Um, so speaking of which, tell us about yourself. Kind of like give us a little bit of a rundown on your your uh, your journey to become a writer, like how you started off, things like that. Wow. Um, I don't even 
think I can remember. You know, I started writing. <laughs> been writing for a while. <laughs> I have been writing for a while. I started writing when I was a child, like most, maybe most people, many people, some people did. I started making, you know, drawing maps um, when I was young. I don't know why. I was an outdoors <laughs> kid. I grew up in the country. I loved being outdoors much preferred that to being indoors. And I always was one of those kids who kind of felt out of place. Um, and there's a lot of complicated reasons for that. It, I think we'll get into gender and gender roles later. But I always felt like I was kind of in the, the wrong person in the wrong place. And so there was a part of me that always hoped that I could just like find that secret gate that would take me into this other amazing magical world that I could live in. Um, and then I began to make up those worlds. And then I went to college and I think like many, I wrote, you know, I finished a book, I finished another book and they weren't very good, which is normal. Um, a p normal part of the process of learning how to write is to, to do some or to learning to do anything is at first you're not that good at it. And then you keep doing it and you get better. And eventually I got um, a book published and I kind of just kept going from there. I've been, I've had ups and downs in the publishing world. It hasn't been like a smooth ride for me, but that's also part of it. And I've just, well, to be honest, at this point, I literally think I have no other skills. So, <laughs> so I'm kind of stuck, <laughs> whatever else I'm kind of like, better oh, for worse. Yeah, I, gotta, <laughs> I can write a story, <laughs> you know, um, hmm. that's the short version. Yeah. Cool, cool. And you, you now have many, many books under your belt. So that is, I, you can, I can definitely say that you, uh, that you can write a story because <laughs> you've written lots of them. I have. <laughs> um, so the kind of the general topic that I wanted to talk with you about today, um, it's something that you've written about uh, before, um, specifically on some, some articles on tour.com that I really enjoyed. And it's kind of about the, the role, I guess you could say, the the, the roles <laughs> more specifically um, that women have had throughout history and kind of the misunderstanding that a lot of people have about that and kind of the, the complexity that people miss um, and how that carries over often into uh, historically inspired fantasy world building. And uh, just kind of to give a, a personal example of, of a book that that I read once that ran into this, um, there was like this, this, uh, this kind of an old male cast that I, that I read. And um, I think there were three women basically that appeared in this really big story. One appeared as like a, a near rape victim that had to be rescued by the characters. Mm -hmm. Another was a prostitute <laughs> and another was a love interest. I was like, yep, those are the only three things women have ever done in history. Um, so, uh, so yeah, what are, what are some of the, some common, misunderstandings that happen. We'll just kind of jump right into the topic. <laughs> Boy, do I have a lot to say on this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, partly I want to say this was my own journey as well, because I grew up in a time where the things I wanted to do, I was told over and over again, those were for boys. Mm. Uh, I was, you know, I'm an athlete, but back when I was a girl, girls weren't athletes. So I thought there was just something wrong with me. I like to play outdoors all the time and climb trees, but that was something boys did. Um, and I kind of absorbed this whole idea that women just had these three things they could do. And so they weren't very interesting. And then as I began to get older, um, partly I realized that, well, I'm a woman and I'm doing them. So that means that at least some women like doing them. But also I began to understand how much I had been fed this idea and how it affected how I looked at people and how I approached writing. And then it began to piss me off. Hmm. And once it began to piss me off, then I began to dig because I realized how much, and I'm just going to stick with fantasy and science fiction because I'm most read in those, um, how much these ideas that are actually, in a way, 20th century ideas have yeah. hampered and hindered good fantasy writing because 
you hear this all the time. Well, the reason that there aren't more women in this epic fantasy is because back then, you know, women were peasant, pregnant peasant women who were illiterate and never walked farther than five miles from their home village. They never did anything. Women never did anything. And there's a couple of things going on in statements like that. And that statement is almost a direct quote. Um, you know, a couple of things going on are, first of all, not understanding the scope of what we would commonly say women's work is and, and demeaning yeah. it in the sense that this is the work that literally keeps the world running. But yet mm -hmm. we say it's not important enough to deal with in epic stories. Um, so that's one thing we have to get over. And then the other one is it's not even true. For a long time, only well, when I started reading history, you know, you would get a book on the Middle Ages and it would have a two page chapter called Women. And then it would mention Eleanor of Aquitaine and Elizabeth II, who is not really medieval. And that would be it. You know, women who were in male roles or maybe Cleopatra because she was a femme fatale. Right. <laughs> and then um, in the I think really the 60s and the 70s, you began to get black studies departments, women's studies department. Later, you would begin to get gender studies department. And people began to start digging more and more. And all this information was there. It had just been overlooked because it turns out that women have always been doing tons of stuff because, of course, they were. Right. Because they were people, right? And they were complex. <laughs> exactly. And so every time, any time, any time you hear a writer say, well, I don't have any X, you know, women don't do X or I don't have women in the story because they're wrong. They're just not either. They're either ignorant and can't mm -hmm. see or they won't see or they don't know how to see. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this. And they're yeah. not. I mean, there's so many ways women can even historically be placed in fantasy stories, not to mention the existence of magic and dragons, which, of course, would open up a whole nother set of options for them. So, yes. Yeah, it's like Conan. You know, if someone says to me, well, I don't think women warriors are very realistic. I'm like, and Conan is realistic. But no one questions Conan mm. as a fantasy character. Yeah, there's there's one thing that you mentioned in one of your articles that I thought was really insightful, which is basically that sometimes when people have this this understanding of what is realistic, it's not really something that has come from them personally researching history. It's more like there are these certain kind of uh, patterns that um, that exist a lot in media. And so people kind of expect them. And there's like this preconceived uh, expectation that like, oh, yeah, I'll see women doing this or men doing this or whatever. I'll, I'll see this in history. Um, and sometimes that is accurate. Sometimes it isn't. But often people don't realize that like they may be drawing this understanding of what is realistic, not actually from history, but from some sort of an expectation that, that they have. Um, so I thought that was a, an interesting insight. Yeah, I think we're really um, we're we're I think often hampered by our expectations, by, you know, the mm -hmm. unexamined assumptions that we bring as writers and also as readers. Uh, when people say, oh, it wasn't realistic for this female character to do X. Well, oftentimes it was realistic, but they believe be based on, I don't know what, right? These, these kind of cultural yeah. narratives that, and the thing about cultural narratives, which kind of define how we look at the world is they're often or almost always culturally specific. Um, every time I see a far future science fiction novel where women are still taking the names of their husbands, I think, first of all, why? Explain to me why. And second of all, I think this person doesn't even know that in many societies in the world today, mm -hmm. or even 50 years ago, women didn't take their husband's name. It's a specific yes. and peculiar custom. <laughs> It's not universal at all. Yeah. Yeah. Just to insert real quickly an example that my um, I had a, some a, a family from Uganda that had joined um, our church back when I was really young. Mm -hmm. And everyone was always confused because every like I think pretty much everyone in that family had a different last name and everyone ended up calling them by the name of like the dad's last name because that was just how you know in our culture we refer to families it's oh they're the and then you right. say the surname but it was it was kind of cringy because it was like oh actually that's not at all you know how that how that works for them um but yeah just just to give a random example of that that's an excellent that's a specific example. cultural thing yeah, yeah. And, and and because i mean 
I was born and raised in the United States, and it sounds as if you were. Yes. Too? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you East might Coast. be Canadian, but you know, I'm <laughs> no. waiting for the eh. Well, I can't do that. Anyway, I can't do the accent. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we we also have that sense in which. I see this also where American writers kind of can't see that things happen outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. that aren't the same. Time. Yeah, as here. So we make these assumptions. Americans have a problem with that. Yeah. And I see that in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, there's so many science fiction, far future, and, and I'm guilty of this too, where the far future society really looks a lot like kind of you know, 1980s U.S., right? And, and yeah. The way people interact, um, because people are just putting that, they're, they're, you grab for the thing that's closest to you, the thing that makes easiest sense. And then when you do that, suddenly you have these kind of cliches and stereotypes or unexamined assumptions. And that happens. That's why you have these stories where the three women in the book are all receptacles for mm. male sexuality. And and I'm surprised that they didn't do the other. Usually the other woman in a book like that would be the caretaker, the mother or the aunt, the one who gave birth to him. Right. And it's like for some guys, that's literally they think that's what women are. You can be the person who cares for the man and nurtures him. You can be the receptacle of his sexual interest. Or you can give birth to his and and or give birth to his heirs. Um, I was just going to say, there are a lot of people that, that may be listening to this that are thinking, yeah, but that there were separate spheres, you know, in history. And it's like there were like different gender roles and things like that. And and I just want to make sure that that is understood that, yes, that is definitely true. The point is that it varied a lot. Right. And so there's this thing where. I think people often have a tendency to kind of assume that their own specific culture is a universal, especially if you if you're not very well read or very well traveled or anything like that. Um, and that's that's totally natural. I don't want to make anyone feel bad for being like ignorant about that. But it is a thing where it's like that's not it's not accurate, you know, and, and oftentimes I think these understandings about you know, what, what women's roles were in history. It, it's, it's very much coming from specifically, it's like a, it's like an Anglo-American Christian kind of a, a perspective on, on gender roles and relationships. And, and people will take that through those lens and they'll look at like all of history and all these untold many different cultures that exist and have existed. Um, and uh, yeah. And it's like, Yes, there there were definitely lots of, you know, obviously there were lots of gender roles and very often um, those were unfair to women. However, it wasn't that simple. And the details vary like far more than it's just very surprising how much they, they varied. Just just research it. <laughs> it's it's yeah. really fun. I actually I'm really glad you brought up that point. Because sometimes when I talk about this, or when anybody talks about that, what people hear is everyone was equal in the past. But of course, everyone right, we're wasn't not saying equal that. in the past. And of course not. And the inequalities lie on multiple different lines. So there were yeah. and, and roles. So I, I like to say that probably the first work division, probably in, hu in the human species, I'm going to say, and I'm right because there's no proof. <laughs> uh, because it would go back far into prehistoric times, is on the division of age. You don't ask a two-year-old to do this, the kind of work you would ask a 20-year-old to do or a 40-year-old. And someone who has survived to be 70 isn't going to do uh, something that a 30, isn't going to have the, probably the stamina and the strength of a 30-year-old. And so that's a division, right? So age in many ways is that first division. And we kind of take that for granted. And then gender. Um, and there are a lot of divisions of how labor and expectations and roles and social, um, social expectations are put on women. And as you said, they differ in different societies. But there's also a way that we understand them where we think that there, there's this simplistic idea that, yes, those harem women in the Ottoman Empire, they were trapped in the harem, and they never mm -hmm. did anything but sit around perfuming themselves, hoping some man would take notice of him. But if you actually study the Ottoman Empire and the women's quarters, you find that 
the most, the, often the second most powerful person in the empire was the mother of the emperor because yes. she had gotten her son on the throne because, you know, his success is her success. But also she can, that these women, they had business interests. They could buy and sell property and, and be involved in merchanting. And whoever was the most powerful woman in the women's quarters could dole out princesses. She could say, oh, I have a princess here and I can marry it to this guy here. And then he'll, you know, become my partisan. And then when my son is ready to become, you know, emperor, he'll be support me. And as you said, it's far more complicated than than this passivity that's put on women, this sense of passivity and helplessness. But while there are people who are in that situation, mm -hmm. passive and helpless, a lot of times, you know, as you said, women are people and with the whole range of ambition and fear and, and intelligence and yes. you know, curiosity. And they always, people will always find ways mm -hmm. to push um, around limitations or to grab for what, you know, what they can. Yes. And that's especially true, like you were mentioning, in like uh, people higher up in, in society, right? Like you think about someone who is the sister of or the mother of or whatever of someone powerful. It's like they can use that to their advantage. People, you know, women would have networks of information yeah. and things like that. And um, it's like there are so many different forms of power, too. And that's that's the other thing that the other side of this that you mentioned earlier that is frustrating to me, where it's like, yes, in those situations when, you know, there were strict divisions of labor like that, it wasn't necessarily to this to this way where it was like all the power was shifted to the men. It's like, think about it. If if you have if you have the women that are pretty much in control of, of the food you're eating, <laughs> like, yeah. They have yeah. some power, okay? You know, like, like yep. if there's one gender that's like controlling, you know, the, the clothing that's being made, it's like, yeah, you know, there's some shared partnership going on here too. There's some different kinds of power. And it's like, you know, you would have people like, you know, it was very common to have kind of the public life or whatever, like, you know, going out and doing, and doing wars or, or doing the government. A lot of men generally were doing that. Okay. And there were lots of exceptions to that as well. But, um, and then generally the home life was, was, uh, something that, you know, women were kind of in control over, but it's like, which do you spend more of your time in? You know, <laughs> the, the, the big public stuff was a lot of what was written down in history. And that's partly why I think some of this, this happens where people have this assumption that women weren't participants in history. It's like, no, they were, they just, they were doing other important things that kind of weren't written down, but but very, very much had, um, you know, tremendous impact on people's day to day lives. They did. And and they had I mean, in the case of we'll look at the Ottomans and I'm sure we could find other. Well, actually. In any hierarchical society, the women in the upper class, in the ruling class are going to be just like men, just as we have men who are in the ruling class who aren't very good at it or, you know, are you know, were terrible kings or, you know, were murdered in their third year because they were drunks or were, you know, had um, Ptolemy the fourth was uh, a drunkard and not very, he was a terrible ruler and he was simply manipulated by his two top advisors. And they just had him do whatever they had him get to have his mother be murdered, for example. Um, so you can have those guys, but, but we don't look at him in the same way as we would say his mom, who was to some degree, I don't, I don't want to say a co-ruler with his father, Ptolemy III, but she was a powerful and influential figure in the court. And then, but because she gets murdered by her son, then somehow she's not that interesting. But, and then the later Ptolemaic women, sorry, I know a lot about the Ptolemies. Um, you don't have to apologize. That's great. <laughs> And, and they were terrible people, terrible, terrible, awful people um, who were really only interested in power, which is a fascinating thing for fantasy to explore. And when you leave out the stuff that women were doing, whatever way they had to do it in, I feel like the literature is poorer for that. Yes, yes. And, and one thing I think that is especially helpful especially if someone's trying to look for kind of like a practical way to help them think about these things differently um, is background characters. 
So that's one of the things that it's like a very often. And, and that, that's something that a lot of us struggle with. I used to struggle with that quite a bit where it's like the default can sometimes be to make every background character male. And that doesn't make sense at all because it's like, well, what do you think all the women were doing? Like, <laughs> like yeah, you have yeah. like approximately half the population are women. It's like, what are they, you think they're just like sitting inside and hi- hiding, hiding, hiding underground or something. It's like, you know, yeah, if you have, even if you have most of your characters are, you know, in war or they're whatever they're doing these things that perhaps in your fantasy society are mainly done by men if they go to the tavern for example and get some food who are they interacting with you know if they go and they they buy some things at the market who are they interacting with it's it's not going to be just men that that doesn't even make any sense (laughs) right and and for example in medieval armies there were laundresses who would follow the armies and do laundry Mm. what a great idea for a someone spying and I bet anything there were women getting paid to do laundry and to report anything they learned back to somebody else. You know, I, that's just one example. But that is the, there is this kind of denigration of women's work and women's and what I'll call traditional women's experience. And this is for me a, an important point that it took me a long time to understand was that if we say women can do anything a man can do, then we're still putting down women's experience. We're still saying it's not as important or interesting and that it's only insofar as she can behave as a man and do a man's uh, traditionally, stereotypically man activities that she matters. So for me, it's we've got to go deeper and we have to say all of these things matter to life. All of these things are part of fiction. It, and it doesn't have to be front and center, but as you said, you can see it in that whole sense of world building, in the secondary characters, in the idea that someone could have to stop and get their clothes washed and overhears two washerwomen talking about the politics of the day in a knowledgeable way or whatever. I mean, I just made that up at the top of my head. But, but showing that people live in the world and that all of this is worthy of our interest and all of this is worthy of our largest narrative. Mm, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, How can people keep up with you, follow your work, things like that? I am on Twitter at Kate Elliott SFF, like science fiction fantasy. I do have a blog called I Make Up Worlds, which um, is kind of in hiatus right now. And I do have a newsletter, which you can find, you can sign up for either on the I Make Up Worlds blog or at my website, which is kateelliot.com. And I'm a, I, I'll be getting busier than that. Um, I'll be getting, the, the newsletter will be coming out more um, when, as uh, my next project gets closer to publication. All right. All right. Well, thank you again. Wait, you didn't ask me what oh. my next project is. What is your next project, Kate? Thank you, because I love <laughs> saying it. It's gender bent. Alexander the Great in space. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, I just love saying that. <laughs> when, so when are we going to expect this uh, gender be- gender-bent Alexander the Great in space? Next year. Next, Next year. year. It All seems right. like a long time, but yeah. It's, All right. it's, Keep, it's done. It's done. Yeah. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Okay. That's exciting. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That was my conversation with Kate. Quick shout out to Brandon, my top patron and the world deity of the Females in Fantasy podcast. Thank you for bestowing your blessings upon us. Amen. Next time on the show, we will hear from Nicole Pierman to pick up the conversation that started with Francina Simone about book controversies and cancel culture in the book community. Nicole and I will be discussing the concept of harmful books censorship, and how to have productive conversations online, which, if we're honest, is something we could probably all benefit from these days. Well, until then, this has been the Females in Fantasy podcast. I am Brianna Da Silva. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.